3, verses 12 to 16. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Let us therefore, as many as be uh, perfect, perfect, be thus minded, and if any things ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. We're in a series right now called Fixed Focus. And this series, as we've said, is about realizing the power of intentional living. Living intentionally is just the opposite of saying, well, whatever. In this series, we're emphasizing how important it is to do most the things that matter most. That's what it means to live intentionally. Now, if you have a camera that boasts the feature called fixed focus, it means that the lens is automatically able to identify and zero in on the subject of the photograph. In doing so, it makes sure that the object is sharper and clearer than the other objects in that image. Uh, kind of like this picture on the screen up here. And it's amazing that cameras can do this. But even more amazing is that you can do this with your life. You can do this in the life that you live. All of the things that life brings your way has a tendency to blur your vision, to make everything look fuzzy and unclear. But when you know what your priorities really are, and you know what matters most, you can live your life in such a committed way that you do most what matters most. You can, uh, you can bring those essential elements into clear and sharp and easy Focus. You can identify those things that are truly important. In week one of this series, we said that life is not an accident. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible tells us that we're God's workmanship. We're His poem, His masterpiece. We are the, uh, we are the work, handiwork of His hands. We are created, Ephesians 2.10 says, in Christ Jesus for good works. And what that means is that we are not the product of evolutionary, uh, an evolutionary accident. God has a plan for your life and mine. In the second lesson, we looked at what it means to live a one Lord lifestyle. Jesus said you can't serve two masters and only he has the right to be Lord of all. And so the writer of Hebrews says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. In lesson number three, we talked about the need for revival because when we determine to live this one Lord lifestyle, we have to understand that our hearts are prone to wonder. Whenever we experience a time of decline or neglect in our spiritual lives, we need to immediately recognize that and then turn our hearts back to Him. That's revival. In today's lesson, we're going to focus on the idea that I've referenced already in this series. I'm talking about making the most of every single day. Today's lesson title is One Day at a Time. One Day at a Time. Uh, maybe you remember the, uh, this perhaps would be a good way to illustrate this, the movie uh, The Dead Poets Society. This movie is about a professor who taught in an elite school back in the 50s, and he resurrected the ancient Latin phrase that had long been forgotten, Carpe diem. And you know what that means. It means to seize the day. What that means is to grab hold of this day and give it all you got. Because the truth is, today is all we have. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow may not come. All we really have is today. So we need to give it all that we've got. And the Bible teaches this. We have only one life to live. 
Uh, in fact, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 9, 27, each person is destined to die once, and after that comes the judgment. So we have one life to live, and this life is lived in one day increments, one day at a time. This is why the psalmist said in Psalm 90 and verse 12, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now this phrase, number our days aright, has a two-sided meaning. It means on the one hand, help us to understand the brevity of life, and it means on the other hand, help us plan our days accordingly. Because our lives are so short, we only have so many days, they're so precious and so few, let us plan those days accordingly. Ephesians fact, chapter 5 tells us to redeem the time because the days are evil. The time that God's given us is so brief and so precious. We have only one life to live, and in order to live our lives to the fullest, to make it all that it can be, all that God desires it to be, we've got to live our lives one day at a time. That's carpe diem. That's seizing the day. And it's what intentional living or fixed focus living is all about. So I want to talk to you today about living with a make the most of this day mentality. That's the mentality that we ought to have. Seize, seize the day each and every day. Uh, we read the text, and we'll come back to it just in a few moments. But let me ask you something. I think uh, I thought about this quite a bit, whether I would do it or not. But uh, how many of you uh, watch football? Show me your hand, dude. If you don't watch it regularly, you've seen a football game. How about that? All right, most everybody. If football had existed in Bible times, do you think Paul would have been a fan? Well, I don't know, but I can tell you this. In his New Testament books, he talks a lot about sports. I'm not the first preacher to come along and use sports, illustrations, anecdotes, uh, those kind of things to try to get God's truth across. Uh, Paul did it in the first century, and he did it by inspiration. The primary sports of his day was running and boxing and wrestling, so he talked about those things. Uh, listen to a few illustrations from the Apostle Paul. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. He's using a sports illustration, talking about earthly things to talk about the heavenly goal of eternal life. Uh, people would automatically recognize this sport and uh, what it would imply, so he just simply uses it to teach these weightier spiritual lessons. That's 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 26. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, the Apostle Paul says there, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And then our text provides another example. And to understand the passage of Scripture here in Philippians chapter 3 that I want us to uh, look at, we need to understand at least that there's a sports analogy here. And if you don't see that and understand that, it'll get by you. Actually, let's go back and read the text if you don't mind. Philippians chapter 3, uh, beginning at verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you may think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Let's tackle this passage of Scripture in Philippians, and let's translate uh, this morning this ancient picture into our modern football analogy. Can I do that? If nothing else, maybe it'll be interesting. <laughs> um, this will help us to live each day to the fullest to live this life one day at a time the way it needs to be lived. First of all, life is like football in that it is not over till it is over. Please understand that. Uh, a good team, they don't start celebrating until the game ends. That's what Paul said in these verses. Victory comes to the team who wants it the most. 
and who's willing to work the hardest all the way to the final buzzer. In fact, winning, uh, the work of winning begins long before the game, even before the season starts. One veteran coach, Joe Paterno, says, the will to win is important, but the will to prepare is vital. Do you hear that philosophy in the opening of our text? Paul says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. The this that he's referring to here, uh, he's saying it hasn't already been obtained. But he's working still to obtain it. He's still moving toward it. Now that goes back to the previous uh, part of this passage. Paul says earlier that his desire was to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of uh, sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. What Paul's saying in this passage is, more than anything else, I want to live like Jesus in this life, and I want to spend eternity with Jesus in the next. And so therefore, I will not be complacent. I will not, I will not allow myself to be self-satisfied. Paul understood if he did that, he'd stop working towards his goal. And you know what? Complacency and self-satisfaction, those are often the biggest obstacles to progress in sports and also in the Christian life. We become complacent and we stop working and we lose sight of the ultimate goal and we start coasting and we become self-satisfied. Coaches know that early success, that can do more harm to a player and to a team than almost anything. A kid can be a great beginning athlete. He may have more size. He may have more ability. Perhaps uh, he may be head and shoulders ahead of everyone else, but a smaller player who's more determined and has a better work ethic, uh, they can come up to that person and then pass that person uh, in time because they don't slack off. But this person that has early success, they think they've already arrived and they stop working. That's the idea that Paul's presenting here in this passage of Scripture. I'm not making this up. Coaches talk about a team peaking too early and they mean that that team did real well and they stop improving before the end of the season. A lesser talented team works hard meets that same team in level of talent and then goes beyond them to win the championship. And everyone thinks that this team was the underdog team, but not really. The underdog team is the team that stops working and they will never win. Not really. Not in the end. That's true in football. That's also true in life. Now the word perfect here in our text uh, deserves a special note. We tend to define perfect as faultless or uh, to be problem-free, but the Bible word carries more the idea of completeness or maturity. It's the difference between a child and an adult or between a project that's finished and one that's only half done. That's what Paul's saying here in this passage of Scripture. In verse 12, Paul says he knows that he is not perfect or he has not completed uh, his goal yet. He has not reached maturity. In other words, he's saying, God is not finished with my life yet. In verse 15, he uses the same word. Our version there in verse 15, though, may actually translate it maturity. And that's probably a bit misleading. And I suspect that when Paul uses this word the second time, that he does it with a bit of sarcasm. He's saying, he's saying here, everyone who thinks they have arrived everyone who thinks that they are perfect, everyone who thinks that they've reached completion, they need to think again. That's what he's saying. You need to take a second look if, you're, if, you're, if you think you've already arrived. If you've become complacent and self-satisfied with what you've done and where you are, uh, you're not going to go any further. You've just caused yourself to stall out. You're not going to be able to live the fixed focused lifestyle you're not going to be able to live the abundant life that Christ came to provide if you live life that way. A follower of Jesus Christ knows that as long as he or she is breathing air, there is still room for and a need for improvement. None of us have arrived yet. None of us are in heaven yet. <laughs> no one can say, I'm everything that I can be, or I'm everything that I want to be, or everything that God would have me to be. We are all at this very moment a work in progress. 
By the grace of God, we're not what we were. We're not what we used to be. But also by the grace of God, we are not yet what we will be. There is still more for us. There is still better for us if we keep working at it. Straining and pressing, those are the words that Paul uses. Now that's true for all of us. In that sense, life is like football. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, the first rule of life in football is it ain't over yet. If there's still time on the clock. Until the buzzer goes off. There's always room for improvement. And conversely, if the past was particularly bad for you, or you're looking at it that way, I mean, you had a hard time in your past in some way or another, and now you're, you're unable to let go of it, uh, this perhaps will, this passage will help you as well. Because there's a lot of us that we're asking right now, why did I have to go through that? Why did I have to do that? Why did that have to happen to me? Why couldn't things have been different? Why could I not have had those kind of parents? Why could I not have had that kind of job? Why could I not have had that much money? And a hurtful past brings bitterness and shame and regret into our present. And that past needs to be cut loose just like that successful past needs to be cut loose. Because the past is just that. It's the past. And if you try to hold on to it either way, it's going to slow you down. And perhaps it may bring you to a standstill. This is why Paul says in verses 7 and 8, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. In other words, Paul saying all of that in the past, that's garbage to me. In his estimation, Paul was saying, I'm going to consider that as refuge. I'm going to consider that loss. I'm going to cut that loose because my goal is Christ. I want to live like Christ. I want to be with Him in the, the life to come. So therefore, I'm pressing on this way. Today, I'm making the most of today. I'm seizing the day and grabbing hold of today and making all of today because that's my goal. I'm saying that if you want your life to go where God wants it to go, then you need to make it your daily resolve to put the past behind you. Focus on today. Go after it, brethren. Go get it. Go get it today. God will bless you if you do. You're still in the game if you're even there. Right? You're still in the game. There's still time on the clock. It ain't over yet. Stay in the game. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. Life is like football. And it requires remembering which way you're headed. Perhaps you've heard the story about uh, Roy Regals. I've told this story several times. I've probably told it here. Roy Regals, he learned the hard way that uh, you have to go in the right direction. Uh, his is one of the legendary stories of collegiate football. Regals was the center and captain of the 1929 University of California Rose Bowl team. Regal's Golden Bears went up against Georgia Tech. And in the second quarter, the game was scoreless when California drove the ball to Tech's 25-yard line. Tech held them there, and Cal gave up the ball on downs, and the next play would go down in football history. And this is the way it went. Tech called a running play. Their fullback barreled through the California line. A Cal defensive back hit him real hard. He fumbled the ball. Roy Regal's scooped up the ball on Tex 30 and took off in the wrong direction. Uh, defensive linemen, they don't carry the ball very often. I guess that could be offered as the excuse, but he got disoriented when he bounced off a couple of the uh, tacklers and he spun free from them, so he started, he started in the wrong direction. With Tech tacklers and his own teammates in hot pursuit, Roy Regals, headed down the field for what he thought would be his very first touchdown ever. He was so caught up in the excitement, he didn't hear the shouts of the fans or the coaches. Thinking that he had made it, Regal showed, slowed down as he neared the end zone, and one of his own players who had been chasing him the length of the field managed to catch up with him and tackle him at the second yard line. He spun Regals around, shouted at him, uh, he stopped him short of the one-yard line, and they were both uh, immediately buried by Georgia Tech tacklers. 
couple of plays later, Tech blocked Cal. Uh, Cal's pun attempt, scoring the safety. Those two points would spell California's loss. So had a brilliant second half, but nobody remembered. He was forever known as Wrong Way Regal. Interesting things that in the locker room, he went into the corner, buried his face in his hands, and cried. The coach didn't say a word to the team or to the Regals until the halftime was over. And he said everyone that was on the field in the first half would go back on the field in the second half. All the teammates left the locker room except Roy. The coach went over and said, Roy, second half, get the game. Speed, talent, and effort in the pursuit of the wrong goal has never and it will never accomplish anything. And if you're running for any goal other than Jesus, I'm telling you, you're going the wrong way. I wish today's sermon could serve to be a tackle for you. I wish I could tackle you before you go across the goal line. You need to go the other way. Amen. Listen to the text here again. But one thing I do, Paul says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. God has called me in this direction, heavenward in Christ Jesus. And there are at least three phrases in this passage that come right out of the world of sports. First of all, he says, forgetting what is behind. That pictures the temptation that every runner faces. How many football players have been tackled just short of the goal line because they slowed down to look over their shoulder? And then there's the phrase straining ahead. That translates a phrase used of runners who are, who are literally leaning in to the finish line. This is a picture of a ball carrier who's stretching, he's stretching for those few inches that he needs to get first down. Even the word goal in our text came from ancient sports. The word goal here meant to watch or see. Our word scope comes from it. That's the idea. Uh, he is here describing a marker or a post that's at the end of a course. And runners are running toward that mark. And a good runner never takes his eyes off the goal. He never takes his eyes off that mark. He's looking at that mark the whole way. A good football player always knows the location of the first down marker or the goal line. Life is like football in that regard. And I want you to note the two directions of this appeal. Paul says forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead. Both those are important. The past can be the future's very worst enemy. That's true individually. That's also true of churches. No one lives in the past. And what's going to happen is when we are living in the past is we're going to fail to live in the present. Mm -hmm. Dear Abby got it right when she wrote, nobody gets to live life backward. Look ahead. That's where your future lies. That's so true. That's what Paul's saying about your life and mine. As Christians, this is your future, not that. Amen. Some of us continue to live in the shadow of our past mistakes. I know I have. Somehow we can't believe that God will forgive us, uh, so we refuse to forgive ourselves. Uh, I find myself praying and thanking God and giving praise to His grace so much more in my life now, realizing that I have been forgiven. And my past is gone. Others live imprisoned in bitterness and anger because they won't let go of wrongs they've done or wrongs that's been done to them. In the past, others quit looking back at the past uh, only when they realize what is still lying out there for them in the future. God has a plan for your life and a goal for you to be striving toward, and it's something wonderful. Let me tell you this story. Al Nolda, uh, you know, he's the actor who played Hawkeye Pierce in the old MASH series. He wrote a book entitled, well, actually, uh, it's a weird title. He says, Never Have Your Dog Stuffed. That's the title of the book. I haven't read the book, but I came across just a portion of it. Um, 
The title came from a childhood experience. When he was about eight years old, they had a family pet, a dog, and uh, it died. Alan couldn't stop crying, and uh, uh, his father was going to bury the dog. Finally, his dad offered a suggestion, maybe we should just have the dog stuffed. And that's what they did. They stuffed that dog, and they kept that dog on the front porch. Uh, it never moved. The neighbors thought that they were crazy. Delivery men refused to come to the front door of the house. They left everything at the end of the drive, and they would have to go out to the end of the driveway to pick up their packages. All the comments, there are a lot of ways we stuff the dog. Trying to avoid change, hanging on to what's past. And then he says, stuffing your dog is never a good idea. And that's pretty good, isn't it? <coughs> Any of you have a stuffed dog in your life? Part of your past that you have not let go of yet? I guarantee we all do, perhaps. A lot of people do. Even some churches do. Life is like football. You cannot run backwards. You'll never win the race if you're running toward the wrong goal. You've got to play the whole game. Perseverance and improvement matter. You've got to remember which way you're headed. Folks, we're headed that way <coughs> toward heaven. Our call is heavenward. In Christ, that's the goal. That's why today... We've got to seize the opportunities that God's given us. Live it today like heaven is all that matters and let the past be where it belongs and that's in the past. Here's the third resolve we need to make. You need to make it your habit to aim for what is beyond you. Life is like football. You have to aim for that which is beyond you. Another way to say it is that you've got to keep reaching for what is above you. Uh, this verse in the King James Version says, verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Whatever your situation, God is calling you as a Christian. He's calling you to stretch. Whatever God is calling you to, He's calling you to reach. And we'll talk about our one purpose in tonight's lesson. But God wants us to reach. He wants us to strain. God wants us to stretch. Paul makes it plain in verse 12, not that I have already attained all this or have already been made perfect. Listen, he says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In other words, he's saying Christ took hold of me has a purpose for my life. I'm now taking hold of what he's taking hold of me for. We're going together in the same direction. And what I'm doing is reaching for that. He set a goal for me that's a high goal. It's a, it's a high calling, and I'm reaching for it and stretching for it. He says it again in verse 13, Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. The NIV says straining toward. The King James Version says reaching forth. That's exactly what the Christian life is. It's a reach. And it may seem at times like it's an impossible reach, but you keep on reaching. That's the idea. It may seem impossible that your marriage could ever get back on even keel and be a godly marriage and a happy marriage, but keep reaching. Keep reaching. That's what the Bible teaches. It may seem impossible that this business plan could work or that your job could be successful or this degree could be attained. But keep reaching. That's the idea. It may seem impossible that you would ever experience power over sin in your life. I thought that for the longest time. But brethren, keep reaching. Keep reaching. Seize the day. That means that each and every day you have to dare to reach for something that is above your ability. You've got to reach beyond your ability and grasp hold of that thing that Christ has taken hold of you for. And what that implies is that there's some things that the Lord wants us to do. We may not think that we're uh, talented enough to do it. We may not think we're educated enough to do it. <coughs> But those are the very things that we ought to be trying to do, the things that could only be done if Christ helped us to do it. And if He helps us do it, He'll get the glory for it. But it's a reach. 
Please understand that. It's something you've got to strain uh, for. It's not going to be easy. This is why the Apostle Paul doesn't come along and say, well, coast, brethren. He doesn't say that. If you want your life to become what it can be, what God wants it to be, you need to make it your resolve to aim for what is beyond you. Reach further and go farther. And then here's the final thing. Life's like football. You've got to know which team you're on. That's why players wear uniforms. No quarterback wants to intentionally pass the ball to the other team. And no one tries to tackle his own teammate unless it's wrong way really. What you do is you block the other team, not your own. A winning team is just that. It's a team. Players are more concerned about their own stats on teams these days, but every team that wins is a team where all the players are playing for the greater good of the team. They're playing together and not merely for themselves. We've seen that even with the uh, Wildcats. Uh, they have these new players coming in every season, these high school athletes that are at the top of uh, their particular uh, sport, and we recruit those players, and they come and stay a year, and they're gone. And everybody knows, well, we'd do a lot better if we could keep a few of these players, maybe for two years or three years, and we could get some of these young players that play selfish ball to stay around and learn what team ball is like. Man, we couldn't be beat. We'd be the best team ever was. It's hard to get that out of these young players. But if you want your life to become all that it can be, you have to know what team you're on. Victory seldom comes to a team where every player on the team is just thinking only about themselves. A team that spends its energy fighting with each other seldom ever has much left for the real opponent. The real opponent's the devil. And this world in which we live, this upside down culture that we're trying to navigate through, like they say, there's no I in team. Life is like football. Now you won't find this last lesson in today's text. I mention it because I've been studying the book of Philippians and uh, this theme is actually in the entire book. I mean, you just have to uh, work your way through the book to see this. But every passage in the book points back to the theme of unity and harmony among fellow Christians, among members of the Lord's church. Apparently, Paul believed his friends at Philippi had some work to do in this area, as I'm sure we have some work to do in this area. But listen to how he makes this point over and over again. In chapter 1, verse 27, he says, Whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. I love that. And then he says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And then in chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God. And then in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, he says, I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women. Now that was true then. All these terms that Paul used to show how we are all part of one team together. We're all working for the same thing together, helping each other. Uh, it's that direction, heaven bound, word to heaven. Uh, that's what the Lord put us all together for, so we can all go together, helping each other <coughs> get to that place. That was true then, and it's still true today. Amen. In life and in football, teamwork is the key to victory. Mm -hmm. So, let's go together. Amen. Let's, let's grab hold of that purpose that Christ has grabbed hold of us for. Let's help each other get to heaven. That's what this is all about. Life's like football. That's, uh, 
easy to see as we think about it in terms of our own day and time, but it's also true as we think about the way Paul used sports in his day and time to make these great spiritual applications of God's truth. There's some lessons worth remembering here, but there's one big difference that I want to end with. Football's a game. Going to heaven's not a game. Amen. Life's not a game. The stakes in a football game is a mark in a win column or a loss column. It may be something that people remember for a while, but it's pretty soon forgotten. Even the big losses we soon forget, except the good ones. We hold on to those for, it seems like, a long time. But it's still football. It's still just a game. But what we're talking about here is life, and the stakes are eternal. So big. The stakes are heaven and hell is what hangs in the balance. That's why it's so important that you, uh, that you get on the right team. You get on the Lord's team. We talked about Jesus Christ being the one leader of our lives. We can only have one Lord, and it's Jesus. You've got to get on His team. Make Him the Lord of your life. Let Him be your coach, your boss, your master, however you choose to term it. But you follow Jesus loyally, faithfully, and truly, and He'll take you to heaven. In fact, Jesus said to those of His disciples long ago, He said, uh, I'm going the way, and I'm going to prepare a mansion for you. In my Father's house there are many mansions, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So the goal of this life is to follow Jesus, to be on His team. His team ultimately is going to win. And I'm asking you this morning as we extend the gospel invitation of our Lord, are you on His team? If not, repent of your sins. Turn away from the past life of sin you've been living. Turn to Him. Confess your faith in Him as the Son of God and then be baptized into Him. In baptism, your soul will be washed of sin and you'll be made free from it. And then you can rise from that water and grave of baptism going in the right direction, following the right leader to the right goal. The only thing that ultimately really matters and that's where your focus needs to be fixed. And if we can help you this morning, we'd love to do that. While we stand together and sing, won't you come to Him? Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hills of the glory now rise in two. Where all shall be made new. Hills of the glory I now can see. Come on, dude.